what I am going to talk about uh, today is uh, uh, some questions around uh, AI and, and genomics. And you'll understand, I hope, what the remaining of the title means uh, throughout uh, my talk. Um, okay, so first, as uh, an introduction, um, uh, I just want to say a few words about AI. Uh, so artificial intelligence, something we hear about a lot uh, today, and that's going to be an important part of some of uh, your um, of the studies of some of you uh, here uh, during your masters. So I think the easiest way uh, to define AI for me is to go back to uh, the origin of the word in the, the Dartmouth conference in 1956, uh, which is the science and engineering of making computers behave in ways that until recently we thought required human intelligence. Um, so the idea is that we want to artificially reproduce behaviors that we would consider as intelligent. Uh, so this definition uh, carefully avoids uh, defining intelligence. Uh, it's just this kind of thing like you recognize it when you see it. Um, okay, so there's sort of two motivations be behind AI. Uh, one is to use it to better understand natural intelligence with, with this idea that if you're able to mm, build a system that behaves intelligently, then you'll better understand what makes us behave intelligently. And also to use it, so to build tools that can help us for all sorts of tasks. Um, okay, so we're currently way closer to the second than to the first goal. All right, so AI involves a whole bunch of things from robotics to expert systems, natural language processing, computer vision, um, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but nowadays, when we talk about AI, in 95% of the cases, we talk about uh, machine learning. This is the last point on this list, and this is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, so now I have to define machine learning, uh, which in French you'll hear now more and more apprentissage machine, but also apprentissage statistique, apprentissage automatique. That's all the same thing. Um, and the idea of machine learning is that you're going to learn uh, and what does you're going to make your computer learn. And what does learning mean? It means acquiring a skill uh, by um, experience or practice. Uh, and so if you translate this, so this definition I've just given of learning, it applies to humans. Uh, so if you go to a math lecture, uh, by experiencing what, uh, you know, hearing what the uh, professor is talking about, reading by yourself, doing the problem sets, you will acquire hopefully a skill about the topic of the course. Uh, it works uh, when you learn how to walk or how to talk. Uh, it works when you train a dog, but it also works for a machine. Uh, if you want to make it work for a machine, you have to adapt a bit your definition of the word. So what I've called the skill will be an algorithm. And what is called experience or practice is going to be examples or data. So the idea of machine learning is that we're going to use some algorithms to build a new algorithm, and this new algorithm is going to use data. Uh, so just to finish on settling up some differences between AI, machine learning, and also you might have heard a lot about deep learning. Uh, so uh, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Uh, so it's a specific category of algorithms within machine learning. And uh, machine learning is a subset or maybe uh, uh, with some differences uh, from AI. Um, so sometimes the three words are used to mean the same thing, uh, but not when you're actually practicing uh, machine learning. All right. Uh, so what I want to do now is to tell you a bit more about uh, supervised learning, uh, which is one subset again of machine learning um, and, and how it works in terms of mathematics. Uh, so the idea of machine learning is that you're going to have some data uh, with their labels and you want to use them to build the predictive models that given new data of the same kind is going to predict their label. Uh, so I don't know if I have so f an example would be you have a bunch of photos uh, as data. Their labels are cats or non-cats for depending whether it's a picture of a cat or it's not a picture of a cat. And your goal is to uh, use machine learning to build 
a new algorithm that, given a photo, is giving a label that's either cat or non-cat. Uh, so from a uh, mathematical or statistical point of view, your goal is to learn a predictive model. Um, okay, so if I want to make this a bit more formal, uh, my data are going to be, so I'm going to say I have n observations and data points, uh, which I'm calling x1 through xn. Uh, I'm writing them here as vectors. Uh, they belong to a space that I generally call x, but as is that is very often an n-dimensional uh, space, uh, and they have labels. Uh, so to each uh, xi, uh, you associate a label yi, again in a space that I call here capital Y. Uh, and uh, so the problem I've described with a cat uh, labeling uh, as cat or non-cat a photo, your space capital Y would be 0, 1, so binary space. You have either a cat, that's 1, or a non-cat, that's 0. You can extend this to more labels, so cats, dogs, panda, bear, whatever, uh, to make it a general multi-class classification task. Or you could also have a regression problem uh, where you're learning a number. So for instance, if you want to predict, I don't know, you are painting, then you want to predict the price of the painting. Uh, so that's, uh, you model that as a real uh, value number, and that would be a regression task. Uh, you can do more complex things, but I'm uh, staying here today with either regression or classification. Um, and so the idea is that from this data, you're going to learn a model that's going to be a function f, uh, an application f from x to y, uh, that uh, approximates this labeling, uh, this underlying labeling function. So this, this means you want that uh, when you apply f to your xi, you obtain the label yi. Okay, uh, so a few more examples and uh, just a cat pitch, the cat uh, photo labeling problem. Um, so regression problems, uh, you can have uh, click prediction. So uh, if you are working in a, a web uh, company, you want to predict how many clicks there's going to be on a specific link, a specific article. Uh, if you're working like me, uh, with uh, people who are interested in biological uh, application, you might want to predict the solubility of a molecule uh, that's going to help you uh, determine whether or not it's a good candidate to be uh, a drug. Uh, binary classification, I've already talked about the uh, photo labeling problem. Uh, one uh, historical example of binary classification problem is spam classification. That's one of the first uh, um examples of the use of machine learning in practice, uh, sort of like widespread, is uh, spam filtering, where so that you, you which can be modeled as a classi binary classification problem. This email, each email is either a spam or not, and you learn from uh, the user labels the emails they receive in their inbox as spam when they don't want to see them. And from this, you learn uh, which email should go directly to the spam folder. Uh, in multi-class classification, uh, you might, uh, so one historical example would be optical character recognition, so being able to recognize handwritten digits or letters, uh, where you have a finite set of possible labels. Uh, nowadays, you might have used some of these apps uh, that uh, let you identify plants or from a picture or birds from their songs uh, in the when you're wandering around uh, in the wild, or not so wild, but you can try them uh, around campus here. Okay, uh, so given those examples, how does it work in practice? Uh, the underlying principle of most machine learning algorithms is something that's called empirical risk minimization. Uh, so again, I have my n data points with their labels, yi through yn. And uh, empirical risk minimization, it's a formula that's written in the middle uh, here. The idea is that you're going to consider a family of functions that uh, you're willing to learn. Uh, so that's what I call capital F here. Uh, so for instance, you only want to learn linear function from your data or you want to learn functions that can be uh, written as a neural network, uh, and there are many other examples. 
Um, then you're going to use a loss function or error function. So that's the orange part here on my slide. Um, so uh, this function's error function is going to tell you how far am I from the truth when I label with f of x uh, a point which, which has for label y. And all what empirical risk minimization is about, and like the underlying principle here in, in most of supervised machine learning, is that you want to find in your set uh, of functions that you're willing to consider, the one that minimizes on average the error on the data, that you're making on the data. Um, so ideally you would find a function that uh, minimizes the error you make on any possible pair of x and y points, but in practice, you only have access to your labeled data, so you do the minimization empirically uh, on those end data points uh, uh, that you have access to. So this is actually an optimization problem. Uh, and the subtlety is often in whether um, how easy this problem is to solve. Uh, so the three things are linked. What is the definition of um, the functions you're willing to consider, what is the definition of your error function, and how easy your optimization problem is to solve. So typically you can have simple sets of functions, for instance linear functions, that allow you, so in this case you'll have an optimization problem that's easy to solve, but you'll only be able to learn linear functions as they might not be very good at solving your problem. Uh, conversely, you can try to learn much more complex functions, uh, but this will typically make your optimization problem harder. All right, so let me give some specific examples uh, of this minim minim uh, empirical risk minimization. Uh, so the first one is linear regression. I've already mentioned several times. What about considering uh, uh, linear functions? So now uh, my data points, they live in R to the P, so they have P, there's P features representing each data point. Uh, so, if, you're, if each data point is an image, for instance, you, c you could consider that each pixel uh, has one value assigned to it. Imagine a black and white image, or grayscale image. Uh, each pixel is uh, one of the P dimensions. It has a number associated to it, which is its intensity. Um, and then you have a representation of your image uh, in P dimensions, where P is a number of pixels. Uh, in practice, for images, we do more complex representation than that. <coughs> that was just one example. Uh, so saying we want to do linear regression, uh, so regress the regression part means I'm going to consider um, real valued labels. So my y i are my y i live in R. Um, and the family of models I'm willing to consider is what's written here. Uh, it's linear function uh, of the inputs, so linear combination uh, of the features, which I'm writing uh, often as a dot product between uh, beta, which is my uh, weight vector, and x, which is the data I'm trying to label, uh, for simplification. Okay. Uh, so now typically when you're doing regression, uh, you're going to use as a loss uh, what we call an error function, what we call the quadratic loss, which is simple, simply the difference between the label and so the true label and the prediction, so between y and f of x, uh, which we square to um, uh, avoid having errors that compensate each other if you're over predicting for one point and under predicting for one point, you want it to be a bigger error and not having the two arrows compensating from each for each other. Uh, it's also for, uh, uh, it also facilitates your, the optimization problems that uh, we're going to write. So again, what I want to do is find a function in this space f, so it corresponds to finding one weight vector beta. Uh, that minimizes, uh, on average, over my n data points, the difference between the true label yi and the prediction, which is this linear combination uh, uh, of the inputs. Uh, and so again, the error is the square root of this difference. So that gives a minimization problem that we know how to solve in practice. 
It's something that's been known for a very long time. It's what's called least squares. Uh, you can also see it as a system with n equations and p plus one um, unknown variables. And so just uh, to be clear on that, uh, this has not been invented uh, with machine learning. We've known how to formulate and solve these squares since, so Legendre if you're French and Gauss if you're not. Uh, so way before we uh, invented either statistics uh, or computers. Uh, but this still fits under this overall framework of empirical risk minimization. Um, all right, so another example uh, of empirical risk minimization uh, is with a multi-layer perception. So now we're getting into a neural network uh, um, uh, framework. Uh, so here, instead of learning simply a linear function, we have uh, combinations of linear functions. So I start with a linear combination of my inputs. Uh, so that's what you see. Uh, and on the first line, so I have a linear combination here with W of my inputs xj, to which I'm applying a function that may be nonlinear that I called b. Uh, and so for each of my inputs, I do that. So that gives me what you see in the intermediate, in the uh, hidden layer, the one that's in the middle. Uh, and I can repeat this operation many times. So that in the end, uh, with this uh, architecture that's uh, uh, described on the board, you have uh, the family of function you're considering. It's what's written at the bottom. You have function of the form A of a linear combination of B of a linear combination of the inputs. And A and B can be nonlinear functions. Uh, so a neural network architecture, uh, so the drawing that you have, is just a way of representing a family of functions. Uh, so here it's one of the simplest uh, uh, neural network architectures that we know with one hidden layer, uh, but you can pile up more hidden layers. You can have uh, arrows that go in both directions. Um, and uh, you can also vary uh, the kind of functions you can learn by varying uh, who are A and B and other nonlinear functions implied in involved in your network. Um, so the overall concepts remain the same. Now I'm looking for weights W and V, uh, yeah, that's it, W and V, uh, that minimize uh, on average over my training points, over my, my data, uh, the difference, the squared of the difference between the labels and the predictions predicted with this function f. Uh, but it makes an optimization problem that's harder to solve. Uh, so the optimization problem is harder to solve, but the function we're learning, it's more complex. It might be better at learning than a simple linear model. All right. Um, so that was a very brief overview of uh, what's supervised uh, machine learning. And uh, so the title of my talk said I was going to talk about, uh, about how this applies to genomics. So first I want to give you a, a little idea of various applications of uh, AI in or machine learning in genomics. Um, so one thing we can try to do is to use those tools to help with diagnosis, prognostics or treatments. So the idea is that you input data about your patients. So that can be, so here I'm talking about genomics. So that will be, measurements that are taken from a blood sample, for instance, uh, that tell you what mutations a person has, what is the expression of different genes, so how much of different proteins uh, can be found uh, in, uh, in their blood, um, and all sorts of other genomics features. And you want to use that to um, help with um, giving a diagnosis or a prognosis. Uh, um, and uh, eventually proposing a treatment. Uh, so just uh, one thing that's, it's, I mean, it has to do with machine learning and how it was found, but it's one example, uh, one of the first example of using geno genomic data uh, to propose a treatment, it's in breast cancer. Um, there's a molecule that's called trastuzumab, which is one of the treatments you can get for breast cancer. Uh, it's only effective if uh, you have an overexpression 
of a, of a given gene that's called HER2. Uh, so if you're diagnosed with breast cancer because you have a tumor in the breast, uh, one of the first things that's done is uh, this genetic test to know whether or not you're likely to respond to trastuzumab. So if you're not overexpressing HER2, there's no way that the treatment is going to work. Uh, if you are overexpressing HER2, there's a good, ch good chance that it's going to work. Um, and so uh, what we're trying to do uh, currently in, uh, in genomics, uh, a lot of the work around this is to try and find this kind of thing for more treatments and more diseases and more molecules. Um, another application of AI in genomics will be to help figure out the function of a gene. Uh, so that's something that's been done for, uh, for a long time. Um, so can you give the sequence of a gene as an input and figure out as an output the kind of things that this gene does? And what I'm going to talk about more now is how to use machine learning to help figure out the regions of the genome that are involved in a particular um, so what we call the phenotype, which is an observed trait. So phenotypes can be whether you have blonde or dark hair, uh, but it can also be whether you're responding or not to a specific treatment given that you have a certain disease, and it can be whether or not you have a susceptibility uh, to a disease. Um, and so to, to give more details about this, um, one way of uh, representing the problem I've just described is a little drawing you have uh, here. Uh, see, so on the left, uh, you have the genomes uh, of uh, several here patients. On the right, you have the patients. Um, so you have patients who are orange and patients who are blue. So that's representing cases and controls. Uh, for here, we'll say whether or not the persons are have the disease. Uh, so here, I'm talking about a classification problem. Uh, and I have. So the little circles you'll see under my DNA, uh, my little DNAs, uh, represent measurements that I'm doing along the DNA sequence. Uh, so they can be all sorts of things, but you can imagine each uh, circle is corresponds to a position where there can be a mutation in the human genome. Uh, and for some people, you'll have the mutation, for some you won't, so that's the value you'll have for each feature is whether or not there's a mutation at this position. And now what's highlighted in yellow is I want to figure out among all those mutations, which are the ones that explain the differences that allow me to classify the people between those that are orange and those that are blue. Um, so I'm, I'm doing here, I'm interested in predictions, so I want to use, oops, okay, won't fall further. Uh, here I'm, I'm interested in using those, uh, this data to predict whether someone is sick or not, but the true goal is not to predict whether a person has a disease, is to know which part of the data I have, which information I'm using to make this prediction. Um, and one of the uh, challenges with this kind of problems uh, is that the typical sizes for my data sets are uh, about a million features and uh, a few thousand, uh, if I'm lucky, a few tens of thousands of samples. So P again is my number of variables and is my number of samples. Uh, and that's what we call uh, so small n, uh, small n large p uh, problems, a problem where you have a few samples in high dimension. Um, okay, so I want to emphasize that this is not big data. So big data is one other of those keywords that you hear a lot around AI. Uh, this is not big data in several senses of the way. Uh, one is that my data, uh, so my entire data set fits uh, fit on my laptop, so it's not the kind of problem for which you need like big distributed architectures uh, in, able to, uh, in order to be able to solve the problem, to at least store the data, maybe to solve the problem. Uh, but mostly uh, those um, uh, few samples, uh, large uh, dimensions type of problems, um, if you represent your data as a matrix, so remember I have my n samples with p features each. I'm assuming that, so I'm assuming that each of my samples lives in R to the p. Uh, I can represent my data as a data matrix where each line is a sample and each uh, column is a feature. And what we mean by big data is 
uh, setup you have here on the screen where uh, the number of variables is usually smaller than the number of samples. We have a lot of samples, so your data matrix is big. Um, the problem I've just described is the other way around. You have an or a few orders of magnitudes more features and samples. Uh, so that's what people sometimes call fat data. Uh, the data matrix is not tall, it's wide. And that poses a number of problems. Uh, first of all, because, I mean, that poses a number of statistical uh, problems. So if you remember when I was talking about linear regression, I made the analogy with fin uh, solving a linear regression. I told you it's solving a system with n equations and p unknown variables. Uh, so you may you might know that if your number of variables is much larger than your number of samples, so if your number of unknowns is much larger than your number of equations, uh, then you're in trouble, you have an infinity of possible solutions and you have to figure out which one you want to choose uh, in this underdetermined uh, system. Uh, so one other issue we have is that uh, big companies who work on AI, they're interested in the problem on the left and on the problem on the right, so there isn't that much money thrown at the problem on the right. But still, we're trying. All right. Um, so now I want to present a few um, ideas that we're using uh, to uh, to try and solve those problems. Uh, so again, okay. So there's several issues here. Uh, one is that I don't just want to make a predictive model. I want to figure out which of my features, which one of my columns in the data matrix, are the one that I used uh, to make this prediction. And I have too many features. Um, so one idea uh, is that uh, to use a priori knowledge that we have about the problem um, to constrain the optimization problem. Uh, so that's what I've written here. We're making an extra, an additional uh, hypothesis that the variables that are useful that are relevant to the label, uh, they follow a given structure. Um, and in a lot of uh, what I do, uh, the structure comes from the graph. Uh, so that's the drawing on the left here, um, where each of the circle is still uh, a variable. Uh, but I have connections between some of my variables uh, and those come from uh, knowledge I have about biology in general, so it's not knowledge I have personally, it's knowledge I find in uh, databases. Um, so there's a lot uh, of interactions between different regions of the genomes uh, that are being studied in a subfield of uh, biology that's called systems biology. Uh, and systems biology comes up with a lot of biological network where the nodes uh, are genes, are regions of the genomes, and the connections, the links, um, represents some sort of biological relationship between those nodes. Uh, and uh, there's a strong hypothesis here, uh, but that's uh, being made by a lot of people and verified in many cases, uh, that the region of the genomes that are involved, uh, for instance, in a specific disease, uh, so there are several of them spread throughout the genome, but they will be connected on an underlying uh, biological network. So it's not like random genes uh, throughout the genome uh, working independently from each other that um, um, yield uh, disease. It's more a sub-network of genes that uh, belong to the same pathways uh, that, uh, for, in for instance, or that uh, have similar functions uh, that will together, um, uh, that will work together towards uh, obtaining the phenotype you're observing. Um, okay. So what does this have to do uh, with my empirical minimization problem? Um, uh, it's, uh, so the relationship is that I can use this, uh, this information, this hypothesis, uh, to constrain my optimization problem. And that's also something that's called regularization. So now instead of empirical risk minimization, I have regularized empirical risk minimization. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea is that, uh, so the, uh, if you look at the problem on the screen, uh, the first part of the problem before the plus sign, uh, it's empirical risk minimization. It's what I had uh, introduced before. And now I'm adding a term 
that's for now uh, pretty obscure. Uh, there's a lambda omega of beta. So here I'm working with linear models. We can extend those ideas to nonlinear models, but because the optimization is much easier for linear models, I'm going to talk only about linear models for now. Um, so I'm adding a constraint on the optimization problem. Uh, sorry, on the so to the optimization problem, I'm adding a constraint on the regression coefficient. So this beta I'm looking for. Um, and uh, so in the case of uh, my graph constraint, I'm constructing a function omega uh, that has two characteristics. Uh, so the first one is that um, I told you I wanted to select some of the features, some of the variables of my problem. So I have those p measurements along my genomes and I want to uh, figure I want to eliminate some of them so that I'm only keeping those that are uh, relevant towards my predictions. So if I'm using a linear model, that means I want that the corresponding uh, regression coefficient, beta j, is equal to zero. Uh, so if beta j is equal to zero, then xj is not used. If beta j is different from zero, then xj is used in the model. I'm selecting this feature. I'm considering that the j's feature is important for my prediction. Uh, so I want. So the first thing I want is that some of my beta j is uh, exactly equal to zero, so that I can eliminate them. And the second thing I want to do is to implement this constraint, this graph-based constraint. Uh, and uh, the idea is that. So again, I wanted to uh, select features that were connected in my network. So what this means is that if one feature is not selected, so its coefficient is zero. Most of its neighbors should also be non-selected and have a coefficient of zero. Conversely, if one feature has a non-zero coefficient, so that's going to be one of the yellow ones here, um, its neighbors should have, most of its neighbors should have non-zero weights. So what I want is that two features that are linked by an edge, they have values that are close to each other. So either both are close to zero or both are far from zero. Um, so that's what I've written here. If J and K are two nodes of my networks that are connected to each other, then I want the regression coefficient, the corresponding regression coefficients to be close in values. That's not the only way you can enforce those graph constraints, uh, but that's one of the possibilities. Um, and so here is an example of uh, the, uh, of a constraint you can write based on this idea. Uh, so you write, you have two things, you want your regularization term, so this constraint omega to implement, so there's two terms here. As uh, a first one, uh, the sum of the absolute value of the regression coefficient, uh, so it's the L1 norm, if you prefer, of the vector beta. This one is going to implement uh, this sparsity constraint, so the fact that the number of the regression coefficients are equal to zero. Uh, so that's not really something I have time to go uh, into details here, but uh, it's something that uh, we use a lot, is that using the L1 norm of the regression coefficient in, the, um, in this optimization problem, it's going to bring a lot of the uh, beta j's are going to be equal to zero. Uh, so you can at least see that it's true that if a number of my beta j coefficients are close to zero, then the omega term is small more than if mm, all my beta j's are different from zero. Of course, it depends on the values of the different beta j's and so forth. But you can sort of see why it's true that, why it could be true, that having a lot of uh, coefficients equal to zero would make this constraint small. Uh, and the second term is looking at for all pairs of, for all edges, so all pairs of variables that are connected on my network, I look at the squared of the difference between the two coefficients. Uh, and if this is small, then the beta j and beta k are close to each other when j and k are connected on the network. Um, of course, the reason I'm choosing those particular uh, ways of implementing my hypothesis is because it leads to an optimization problem that I know how to solve. So you always have uh, these two things to keep in mind. What are you trying to model and modeling it in such a way that the optimization problem can be solved. Um, okay, uh, so you can 
you can have variations on the theme uh, instead of so. So far, I've been talking about linear models uh, where you're making a prediction that's a linear combination uh, of the features. I haven't talked about how you convert this in the case where you have a binary label to predict 0 or 1, because you're not going to predict 0 or 1 with a linear combination uh, of p values. Uh, but one other point of view you can have on this problem is what I call regularized relevance, um, where instead of minimizing the prediction error, you want to maximize a measure of relevance of the features, the set of features you're selecting with the output. Uh, so for instance, you could think about maximizing the correlation of the selected features with the output. You can use statistical tests and all sorts of complicated things in here. Uh, so whereas before I wanted to minimize the error of my model under some constraint, now I want to maximize the relevance of the selected features under some constraint. Uh, so what? Uh, so so that's uh, the problem that's written here in the middle. So I've replaced my mean with a max because instead of minimizing an error, I want to maximize the relevance. Uh, and also, instead of having an optimization problem uh, on, on RP, so with continuous uh, value, here I have a discrete optimization problem, where for each feature, uh, it's either going to be selected or not. Um, so um, this, if you've done a bit of optimization, I don't know if that's the case yet or not, uh, you might be surprised that I'm willing to replace a continuous optimization problem with a discrete optimization problem, because generally discrete optimization problems can be harder to solve. Uh, but some specific discrete optimization problems we know how to solve very well. Uh, and it turns out that this is the case uh, in the example I've uh, written here. So if uh, my relevance is just, so the relevance of a set of selected features is just the sum of the individual releva relevances of the different features. And if my constraint uh, is the one that's written here, uh, then we know how to solve this problem. So the constraint that's written here, it looks very similar to the one I had on the previous slide. So previously, I had a sum of two terms. One was enforcing sparsity by looking at the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients. The second was enforcing this connectivity constraint, the one that comes from the graph. Uh, here it's the same. The first one is enforcing sparsity by counting how many features I've selected. Uh, so I'm penalizing a solution that selects a lot of features. Um, and the second one is enforcing, enforcing connectivity uh, by simply counting how many times I'm how many of the edges of the network have are connecting one selected features with one feature that is not selected. So if you go back to the little drawing I had here, uh, you see that some edges are between a non-selected and a selected um, a node. So there's a few edges, of course, between a white and a yellow node. Otherwise, it means that either your entire network is yellow or your entire network is white. Um, but the fact that my yellow features are connected to each other um, reduces the number uh, of connections between yellow nodes and white nodes. Uh, so if I had only, um, if my yellow nodes were spread out throughout the network, then for each yellow node uh, would be, all its neighbors would be white, I would increase the number of edges between a yellow and a white node. Um, okay, so this uh, um, problem looks a lot so this discrete optimization problem looks a lot like the like continuous optimization problem of the previous slide. Uh, and uh, we have tools uh, from graph theory um, that allow us to solve this problem very efficiently. Uh, so it's something that's called a min cat max flow problem. And uh, it's actually this problem can be solved more efficiently uh, than the previous one for the same, if you have the same number of samples and the same number of features. Uh, this formulation will be more efficient than the previous one. This formulation, however, will only tell you which are the important features and will not provide you with a predictive model. Um, so which is okay in my application where I wanted to figure out what where's the important features. Uh, but it's not, uh, if you want a predictive model, then you have to build something from those selected features. All right. Um, 
So there's a second idea I wanted to present that's building on top of the previous one, um, which is uh, that you can use this regularization uh, to build constraints that um, allow you to solve several problems, solve several problems together. So imagine now that I have two data sets, uh, and one is uh, related to, let's say, breast cancer. So whether or not these people have breast cancer, well, maybe I'll take another example. Uh, we're going to talk about response to treatment. So I have those two data sets, and the first one is about people who are have breast cancer and responding well to one specific treatment. And the second one is about people who also have breast cancer uh, and are responding, whether or not they're responding well to a second treatment. So it's not uh, uh, absurd to imagine that the genetic uh, drivers of response to treatment are at least shared between those two things. Uh, so of course the, tre the treatments are act differently on different parts of the genome, on different proteins. Uh, it's not going to be exactly the same features that are going to be involved, but because the underlying uh, problem is the same in both cases, which is that there's a breast cancer. It's not, um, it, it's a good hypothesis that at least some of the variables are shared between the two, uh, those two tasks. Um, so you can use uh, reg uh, regularization terms that's going to enforce that uh, the um, solutions of the two problems are similar in some way. Um, and uh, so, sorry, I'm not going to show this example yet. Uh, so one classical way to do this is to use, so if we go back to the empirical risk minimization, is to, you can write a constraint that's going to force um, that the same coefficients are non-zero in the different, in the two, for the true problems, but they can be different coefficients. So you're going to use the same regions of the genomes, but not in the same way. Um, so one advantage is do in doing that uh, is that by pooling my two data sets, I have more samples uh, than previously. Uh, so that's one artificial way of increasing your number of samples. The non-artificial way of increasing your number of samples being to like find, find more people uh, with the same uh, disease you're interested in and uh, sequence uh, um, more of them, and uh, that's much more expensive than pulling together two data sets that already exist. Also, some of the phenotypes that we're interested in, they might be rare diseases, thankfully, uh, and uh, it just doesn't exist enough people uh, with the disease for us to increase uh, the sample size. Um, okay. So maybe I skip that uh, because it's one complex example of uh, a regularization term we can use uh, to, to tie two tasks together. Uh, and uh, so this other one, um, it's a variation on the example I've just given. Uh, so the example I was giving you was we have two phenotypes that are, so response to treatments here that are, that we imagine are close to each other because, and so because they are close to each other, we imagine that the underlying regions of the genomes that drive them are similar. Uh, you can also use these ideas to turn around this problem. So having exactly the same phenotype, but in different uh, populations. Uh, so in different populations, you'll have, different, uh, you'll have a difference in the regions of the genomes that explain a disease. So there are some, for instance, still again in breast cancer, uh, some uh, susceptibility genes uh, are particularly uh, or only applicable uh, to white people, while some other susceptibility genes uh, are uh, um, susceptibility genes in black people only, and so on and so forth. Uh, so depending on uh, um, the population you're from, it's not the same genes uh, that change your risk of developing a certain disease. So we can also use uh, this type of combining several tasks, what's called multitask learning, uh, to uh, find, so some of the regions we're looking for, they're the same across population, but we want it to be possible for some of the regions to be specific to some populations. Um, and that can also be solved by designing uh, proper regularization terms. All right, 
um, so I hope I've given you, given you an idea of uh, how machine learning can be used in, uh, in genomics. There's many more problems that can be addressed, uh, and uh, it's just a, um, a snapshot of, of some research questions. Um, and I want to use this to highlight some of the challenges uh, that we're encountering. Uh, so this is generally true in like, the majority of genomics application. Uh, it's uh, something that has to do with the um, size of the data set where we have few samples in very high dimension. So very different from uh, a, a large number of other machine learning problems. Um, there's also something uh, that uh, makes our job harder here in, in genetics uh, compared to uh, if you're doing machine learning for, I don't know, translating text or identifying uh, what are the objects on an image. Those are hard problems, but we know how to solve them as, as humans. Um, so first, we know they're solvable entirely. Uh, and second, we can use the fact that we know how to solve them to develop intuitions about what are good representations of the data, for instance. Uh, and this is uh, actually what's behind uh, a lot of uh, some specialized neural network archi architectures. In biology, uh, we're talking about problems that we don't know how to solve as humans. So we have good reasons to believe that you can use genetic information to predict at least partially uh, susceptibility to some disease or some response to treatments. But no one knows how to look at a genotype and figure out from that, okay, is this patient, I should give them this treatment. So this makes our job harder because it's much harder to uh, develop the right intuitions if you want. Uh, and uh, so that's also something that's uh, being more and more uh, important for all applications of machine learning. It's all those notions of explainability, sorry, or interpretability. Um, we, we don't just want to make predictions. We want to be able to understand where those predictions come from. Uh, so this is more and more true for systems. I mean, if you're building an autonomous car, uh, you want to know, uh, I mean, before you put it on the road, uh, you want to know why it's making some decisions to overtake, for instance, uh, or stop at uh, light or not stop at a pedestrian crossway or this type of things. Um, so as machine learning is being more and more used for s everyday things, uh, it's becoming more and more important uh, to have interpretable or explainable models. Uh, but for us, uh, there's a lot of things we're doing in genomic applications or actually in using machine learning for scientific research uh, in general, so what people call AR for science now, uh, where we want to use our models not just to make predictions but to better understand uh, our, our data. And so interpretability has always been a very strong point uh, of our model. We're actually here, we're more interested in interpretation than in prediction. All right, so with this, I have to thank a large number of people uh, with whom I have worked uh, on uh, the thing I've presented here. So from my lab, which is a center for computational biology of uh, Mines Paris and Institut Curie, uh, from uh, the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, where I did a postdoc, and that's where I started working on those questions a long time ago now. Um, and some collaborators from different uh, institutions and companies. I thank you for your attention. And before I take a few questions, uh, I also have to thank the funding for this research. Uh, so throughout the years, uh, I've received uh, funding both in, in Germany and France and from the uh, European Research Council and from Sanofi uh, to work on these questions. And that's something you have to acknowledge. Uh, science doesn't come cheap. So you have to find money to do it. All right, I'll take a few questions. Oui. C'est comme vous voulez. Ah, alors, euh, sur mon parcours, euh, maybe I'll answer in English, nevertheless. <laughs> uh, so, I've, uh, I, I'm an engineer. Uh, 
uh, in background. So I'm uh, in computer science and telecommunication engineer. I went to Telecom Bretagne. Uh, and I started, I actually started getting interested in applications of mathematics to biology when I was in class prepa. Uh, then I forgot all about it. And then I had the opportunity of doing a master research internship uh, in a lab that was uh, working on that. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. And that's, so then I did a PhD in uh, related fields. I, my applications were more on organic chemistry uh, and, uh, and so on. But I had, um, I mean, I had no biology in my training uh, since high school uh, when I started working on that. So that's, that's a field that's highly interdisciplinary. Uh, Nowadays, you have masters in bioinformatics. Uh, I graduated my masters in 2005, and there was maybe one master in bioinformatics in the whole of Europe at that time. Uh, so it's uh, um, it's a bunch of people with a mathematics background, engineering background, computer science background, biological background that get together uh, to work on those things. And after the years, you start understanding more and more about uh, the other domain, I guess. Okay, so I think this is maybe something that Francis will talk about as well. But uh, there's basically three uh, classes uh, here of optimization problems. There's the one that you know how to solve uh, theoretically, so you have an analytical solution. Uh, so you can write explicitly the solution. Uh, that's a very small part of the optimization problem we're interested in. It's in essence, it's linear regression. Um, there's problems uh, that you know how to solve numerically as W well as you want, uh, because they are convex optimization problems, for instance. Uh, that's a larger part uh, of the set. Uh, and then uh, there's problems that are not convex optimization problems, for which uh, you have much fewer uh, or non no theoretical guarantees, and where your numerical procedures also don't give you any guarantees that you're any close to the true minimum uh, you're going to get to a local minimum, but it can be very far from the global uh, minimum. And that's actually uh, all of neural networks, for instance. So all of deep learning is optimization problems that we don't know how to solve. Um, so that's a huge part, actually. 